Hello and welcome to KU Pulse, the podcast. My name is Jade Sterling. I'm your host for this episode and we're joined by Dr. Abdul Rahim Sajini, who is an expert on skin cells, stem cells and the fight against obesity. Here to talk about um, all of that to us today. Hi. So let's start with something really simple. Yes. What's a stem cell? So stem cells are specialized cells that uh, we have in our bodies. Um, they could make two decisions. So they could uh, decide to maintain themselves as stem cells or they could become something else. And most cells don't have the, that plasticity. Uh, they don't have the ability to make those decisions. I'll give you an example. Um, your neurons, for example, mm-hmm. right? So all your life when you're born, they stay like neurons. They don't have a decision to change their identity. But stem cells have the, the chance, the ability to change their identity from a stem cell to a specialized cell. So that's what's a stem cell. So why do we have them? Because uh, I'm taking it right back to basics. Yes. Yeah. Because if a cell, it, a skin cell, because that's what we're going to be talking about. Yeah. When it replicates, it makes another stem cell. So what do we need? Sorry, it makes another skin cell. So what do we need stem cells for once we've got past the point of growing into a full human? Yeah. So so let me just also go back that there are there are different types of stem cells. Okay, so we have adult stem cells are the one that we have in our body now as adults. Mm -hmm. We also have embryonic stem cells. So these are stem cells that actually make a human. And uh, so they're very uh, early on in our development. And then we also have something we call umbilical cord stem cells. These are the ones that are shared with your mother Mm -hmm. during uh, childbirth. So these are the main three different types of stem cells. So why do we have stem cells later on in adulthood? It's really to maintain your body uh, because these are cells that replenish organs, right? So they replenish your skin, they replenish some parts of your brain. And I mean, different organs, there are different groups that kind of say they're replenished or not, like for example, the heart. But the main main reason we have stem cells is that they replenish organs, Mm -hmm. like with injury, for example, like your muscles, your skin. Um, or just like homeostasis, like your gut, for example, your GIT tract renews every couple of days. So something like that. Your okay. hair, for example, right? Your hair grows. So the stem cells, the reason why they're there is to keep your hair growing for, for, for your whole life. And so we have a set number of them within us and there's a certain way of the body making them and making sure we have enough of them. But your, your research is actually working on turning skin cells into stem cells, is that correct? Yeah, so we have a certain number of them, of course. And, uh, I mean, there's a real, like, balance that your body needs to maintain. Because if that balance is not maintained, I mean, usually we see that going to a cancer. Okay. Okay? So the balance is really important that you're, we call that homeostasis, um, between destruction and renewal. Yeah, so, so some of my work here is involved in what we call reprogramming. So we take skin stem cells, for example, fibroblasts, but we also use other types of mm. cells. Uh, we're currently using uh, CD4 positive cells from the blood, and we reprogram them back to embryonic state. We call those human-induced pluripotent stem cells. And, uh, and then once these are reprogrammed back, we can actually take these cells and differentiate them to any specialized cell. I'm going to touch on how you do that in a second because yeah. that sounds really interesting. But I'm assuming the point of doing all of this isn't to give a random bunch of people cancer, yeah, yeah, but yeah. instead to experiment on them and see what's going on and actually make stem cells that you can use in a lab to further other areas of research. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, so this is, again, this is a very uh, specific type of stem cell. We call them um, human-induced polypotent stem cells. And these were introduced in the world in 2007 and from Japan. Uh, a scientist named Yamanaka discovered that cells can actually revert back in its development stage, and lose its identity and gain a, a, a new identity, right? And we could imagine in humans it's really hard to study develop, developmental biology, mm-hmm. right? Because because of ethical issues and also, I mean, it's, I mean, you can't like uh, it's it's not possible to ask someone to have a baby and you kind of gen, gen, genetically engineer that, right? So there isn't any other alternative to kind of a window for studying human development. So people go into animal models, mm-hmm. right? So they go to mouse, um, sometimes to rats, and sometimes even to larger animals. But I think with with the pressure to kind of replicate what happens in humans, people kind of started to think about other ways. 
and these stem cells came as a good model mm. because what what happens is that you can go to someone that has a genetic problem and just take some cells, reprogram them back to this embryonic state, and then ask those cells to become specialized cells, like for example, brain or whatever organ that you're studying, and then study how what happens throughout that development stage. So it gives you a really precise window of what happens during human development. It sounds a bit science fiction, you know? It is. I mean, when you kind of think about it, it is. But like when you're in the lab and you're kind of doing these experiments, uh, some of them take a very long time. And, um, but it, it actually works. When you say that they can be reverted back to their original stage, does yeah. that happen organically, randomly in the body as well? Or is that something you have to do in the lab with human intervention? Yeah, so, so this is the, the idea. This is why Yamanaka got the Nobel Prize. Um, and he's one of the shortest ones that got in, in 10 years uh, because he was able to show that it can be synthetically done, mm-hmm. right? You just overexpress a couple of genes and, uh, and it's actually reverted back. It loses its identity like we're talking about. And uh, so it doesn't have, in humans, it doesn't happen. It's not something natural, right? So this is synthetic made yeah. stem cell. Um, and actually, if you think about it, I mean, this is something that we also think about in the field a lot is that human embryonic stem cells, the original ones, right, that, that we have as, we, as we're developing, uh, they're not intended to stay for a very long time. They're actually, their half-life is very short. It's maybe half a day, right? We call them the inner cell mass. Uh, and then the idea is that these cells will become specialized. So actually taking them out and keeping them in the lab for a very long time is something synthetic and artificial. So a, a lot of what we do is, the, is artificial, and it's uh, very de novo for humans. But it kind of gives us that science fiction part that yeah. you're, you're talking about. You do make it sound so easy. Oh, we just express a couple of genes and then yeah. we can just change your cell into something completely different. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Genuinely that easy? I mean, it's not that easy. I mean, my lab here, we produced the first uh, MRIT-induced mm-hmm. polypotent stem cells. Uh, I mean, it was the, this, the technology was there from 2007. But only when, when I came and we started 2018, we were able to do that. So it took a, a, quite a long time. So I'm not saying it's easy, but like if you have the right uh, expertise, the right lab, the right people, it can happen. Excellent. Yeah. You mentioned it was Emirati specific, obviously yeah. where we are, that makes sense. But what are the kind of differences between an Emirati stem cell versus, I don't know, a British yeah. stem cell? Is there really that much genetic difference that you'd have to do it in such a specific way. Yeah, exactly. And I think this is, we're coming into a modern phase when it comes to something we call precision medicine, right? Is where you want to tailor the therapies to a very specific mm-hmm. population or very specific uh, person, right? Uh, now, British genomes, like if you want to talk about it that way, or their background, genetic background, is very different than Arabic backgrounds, UAE, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, here is more tribal and more closed. Uh, the genetic pool is very tight. And uh, in British background, the, the, the genetic pool is very wide, actually. You have different backgrounds uh, mixing. So the genetic background is quite different. Uh, and, and the models are quite different. So if you want to go into precision medicine and you're using like, genetic backgrounds from, for example, Britain, it's going to be really difficult to replicate that here and vice versa. So in the precision medicine world, uh, you need to kind of stick with each one. So Britain, Britain, British IPS cells, we call them for them, and then UAE cells for us. Even within like our region, for example, Saudi Arabia, for example, and the UAE is quite different. So even between tribes is different. It's amazing to think that. I know you've called it precision medicine, which implies some level of needing to be quite precise. But it is quite funny to think that, you know, we're all humans. You'd think that on a genome basis we'd be able to, it wouldn't matter. But yeah, no, it's it's interesting to hear about that. So in terms of using these stem cells that you've got in your lab, you've gone to all the effort to make them. You've now got a whole host upon which you can experiment. What are you doing with them? Yeah, so currently what we're doing is uh, we're interested in obesity. Um, and we got interested in that because a gene that was discovered, I mean, it wasn't discovered, but it was studied here before. Uh, Dr. Habiba did a study where she found a gene called FTO. It's called fat obesity mass, fat and mass obesity gene. It was quite prevalent in people that in the UAE populations that are quite mm-hmm. obese. And I got interested in that because FTO is a, it's an RNA demethylase. So it, it, what we call it, it, edit, uh, it edits RNA. 
And that's one of the things that I'm really interested in. So what we did was we went to people that have very specific you know, genotypes, like genetic backgrounds. Uh, so they have this predisposition to obesity in this gene. And we made from them iPS cells. And then we differentiated that into fat cells as a, in a very simple word that way. And then we're actually looking into what are the things that are making these fat cells, for example, very obese. And we're finding that there are some things that have to do with mitochondria, with energy. Um, so when, when, when we see these results, I'm kind of looking back and saying, you know what, like, I do agree with obesity being like a problem, right? Because a lot of the people, people, a lot of the times people blame the, the individual, right? Either not exercising or eating badly. But actually when we look at, when we look at the mechanisms, the molecular mechanisms, actually it's kind of things are against them. So I want to touch on a couple of things that you mentioned there, starting with the RNA. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's the, the, the part of the cell that determines which protein is made. Yeah. So you're saying the gene in certain individuals that turns on a different protein that can lead them to possibly being more likely to being obese. Yeah. That's so, amazing when you take it that small. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's basically what happens. I mean, what we find is that, that they have a certain version of the gene. Mm. We think it's, we're still not sure, but we think it makes it hyperactive. And that causes that the, the RNA-modifying protein to work like 200%. And then thereby changing a couple of things in the genome, in the RNA levels, that will then change other things in the mitochondria. So you reckon you can just switch it off? That's the idea now. So now that we have, I mean, almost clear picture about what's happening, we want to try to kind of find small molecules that can turn off. I mean, not turn it off, but at least turn it down. Okay. Yeah. That, and that isn't going to have any kind of unexpected effects on human metabolism or anything yeah, like that? Yeah, I mean, that's something, that's something we're thinking about, of course. For now, I mean, we're doing everything in the lab and mm. everything is closed. And uh, I mean, we were just asked about that yesterday. One of my PhD students was um, defending her thesis, and this is one of the questions we got: is that how you're going to make sure that other types or other organs? And this is something that we're thinking about. You touched on the ethics before, yeah. and how you can't just experiment on people as yeah. you want because you know there's ethics involved. They have to be. Course, we have to yeah. look after people. So it is amazing that you can keep everything in the lab, mm -hmm. and that's the point that I'm trying to make: is that it's so incredible that you can take something very specific to one individual and replicate it across a workbench. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's amazing because you can take these cells and make neurons, you can make heart cells, pancreatic cells. We have a project in the lab for that. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite amazing, yeah. So where are we going next? I think for, for the lab is, um, is trying to figure out the, the small molecules mm. so we could at least turn down the, the enzyme and see if we could kind of th get things back to, no to normal levels. And, uh, and, and we're also looking at, so when, I when, when we're talking about fat cells before, there's actually three types of fat cells. We call it white adipocytes, mm -hmm. and we have brown adipocytes, and we also have beige adipocytes. So we were actually looking at only one, which is called beige adipocytes. And we're trying to look, now we're trying to look at different types, like white, which is the one that has a major role in obesity, and brown as well. So we're trying to look into these as well. That's the next stage. Is there any further uh, work we can do in other diseases? Type 2 diabetes is fairly prevalent here. Does that have any kind of link? Yeah. Um, I mean, obesity being like a cofactor, right, in diabetes, we're kind of looking in, in diabetes in a different way. We're looking at it in RNA modifications. So we're looking at it in a very different aspect. So in the lab, we're kind of differentiating between those two projects. But we're also looking into, of course, into diabetes and uh, we're looking into something we call islet transplants. So this is a procedure that was kind of pioneered in Minnesota, where I did my master's degree there. And uh, it's a very novel way how to treat type 1 diabetes. Is uh, You kind of collect the beta cells from donors mm -hmm. and then you just inject them directly into the liver of a recipient that's basically suffering from severe type 1 diabetes. It actually cures them for about six to seven years. Yeah. How? Well, the liver and, and, and the pancreas during development, they come from the same progenitor cells. Mm -hmm. So they're quite relatives, right? So um, so what we do is we take pancreatic cells, pancre pancreases from deceased individuals, right? And we just take the beta cells that produce insulin 
we actually tend to take a couple uh, of pancreases and then you, you get a bag full of beta cells. Then you just inject them directly to the liver. And because the pancreas and the liver are quite relatives during development, the cells kind of understand that this is the relative organ, mm -hmm. so it just straight away homes into them. And it starts like binding into the walls of the what we call the portal vein. And then it starts responding to, to glucose, and then you actually treat these individuals for type, from type 1 diabetes. That's incredible. Yeah. But the problem is that it only stays for about six to seven years because the cells are sensitive, and then mm -hmm. they, they die off, and these people need to, another course of injections of cells. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to extend that life by playing around with RNA modifications in these cells. It sounds like there's an awful lot you could do with just this very... I don't want to say simple technology because it's not. The amount of effort and work that's gone into developing this, as you said, just changing a couple of little molecules. Yeah. But it sounds like there's so much you can do with it. Exactly. I mean, there are there, there's the, the sky's the limit, and yeah, and it's good that like for me, like Emiratis are in, are training on this because most of my my PhD student, Mohad, he's an Emirati national, and he's working on this, and he's learning all the techniques required. So it's kind of like this technology transfer, right? Yeah. How far away do you think we are from actual precision medicine? I think we're almost there. Um, I, I mean, I know in Japan they've already done a couple of clinical trials where they actually gave individuals ret ret retinas from their own cells, from these iPS cells that we're talking about. So they, they're actually successful. And uh, I mean, we were just in a conference a while ago, a couple of days ago, and we were hearing about clinical trials from pancreatic cells. So beta cells that were generated from uh, from individuals' iPS cells. So there are things here and there. I think we're almost there. Um, uh, we're almost there. This is really exciting stuff. That was such an interesting conversation. I'm so glad you were here to talk about it because something so important is having all of, is being able to give so many people who are suffering from various diseases yeah. some hope for the future. Exactly. So thank you for the work that you do and thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. If you enjoyed that episode, please feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also find us on SoundCloud and Spotify. KU Pulse, the podcast.